Hi, it's Katrina. Bloodthirsty Monster Crocodile Uganda is home to Osama the Crocodile, the terror of Lake Victoria and one of the scariest man-eaters of all time. He was blamed for the death of over 80 villagers, and so they considered him to be a terrible and bloodthirsty monster. The crocodile was nicknamed Osama because the local villagers viewed him as a terrorist. He had such power that he managed to wage a war against the people living in the small village of Luganga, with some even claiming the crocodile to be the devil himself. The village is positioned right on the edge of Lake Victoria. It would be a nice place to live if the lake weren't filled with giant man-eating creatures. Osama the crocodile was estimated at around 75 years old. Between 1991 and 2005, he single-handedly managed to wipe out roughly a tenth of the local population. There were stories of the killer crocodile snatching children from the lake shore, capsizing fishing boats, and then eating the fishermen, and just being all around rude and vicious. In an interview with the Sydney Morning Herald, a man who survived being attacked by the brutal crocodile recounted how he and his brother were rowing a boat across the lake when the crocodile came out of nowhere, snatched his brother out of the boat, and then disappeared underwater with him. Several days after the incident, the locals found the dead man's head and arm. Osama learned to not only flip boats, but jump on top of them to carry off his victims. Rumors spread that the beast was immortal. Finally, in 2005, the monster crocodile was captured after a stakeout that lasted for a week when witnesses saw him attack and devour a 12-year-old boy. Enough was enough, and so the local wildlife officials and the villagers set a trap and waited at the croc's favorite hiding spot known as the butchery. It took over 50 men to haul the angry crocodile, but instead of killing the monster, he was handed over to Uganda Crocs Limited to be part of their breeding program. This company supplies crocodile skins for luxury handbags. Wildlife campaigners are not happy that Osama will be fathering future handbags, but the locals think that he got off too easy. What do you think? Let me know in the comments below. Mysterious Russian Monster An unknown and creepy creature was recently found by Russian soldiers at a beach in Sakhalin. This is a small region on the east coast of Russia, close to Japan, over 5,000 miles from Moscow. At the time of the discovery, nobody could figure out what this creepy creature was. It almost looked like a melted crocodile or alligator, but that probably wasn't the case. It also wasn't a fish based on the bones and the teeth. It appeared to have skin and hair, though it was hard to tell because the creature had already decomposed so much. Local reports claimed that the monster was taken by Russian special services to be studied, and chances are they won't tell us what the monster is, even if they do figure it out. In a case like this, scientists usually come forward with at least some kind of speculative guess as to the creature's identity, but this time, nobody even had an idea. The creature looked to be roughly 15 feet long, without any limbs and a skeletal tail that made up most of its body. Its head looked just like a crocodile's, but there was no way a croc could have made it all the way to the eastern shores of Russia. For now, this creepy monster is just another mysterious beast that washed up on shore that nobody can identify. Even though Russian special services took the thing to be studied, some suspect they simply threw it in the incinerator and burned the evidence. Bird Killing Ants Unknown to most Americans, there was a horrifying menace plaguing a wildlife refuge in the Pacific Ocean on the United States-controlled Johnston Atoll. It was a plague of creepy yellow ants that spit acid and eat birds. These insects are some of the freakiest in the world, known simply as yellow crazy ants. For over 10 years, they steadily killed the local nesting seabirds on the island. The way they did it was absolutely terrifying, as nature can be. First of all, these ants come from Southeast Asia. It's not clear how exactly they made it onto the small island in the Pacific Ocean, but they got there anyway and began to wreak havoc. They would sneak up on seabirds in large groups, blinding the birds with acid, and then swarming their bodies and devouring them alive. It's like something out of an insect horror movie. It was devastating for the seabirds because the Johnston Atoll is the only piece of dry land within roughly 600,000 square miles. It's an important place for tens of thousands of birds to land, with at least 15 species of bird hanging out on the island. But don't worry, U.S. officials say they've taken care of the problem. A specialized strike team hunted and killed every last yellow crazy ant on Johnston Atoll, according to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services. After a long and tiresome hunt, the strike team then used sniffer dogs to make sure not a single ant was left alive. 
This was the first time an invasive species was successfully eradicated in the United States, or U.S. occupied territory. Queensland Tiger Because of its separation from the other continents of the world, Australia is renowned for its unusual species of animal. After all, where else do you get so many unique and deadly creatures in the same place? There's far more to see in this country, though, and there have been a number of sightings of unusual animals. One in particular is known as the Queensland Tiger, also called the marsupial lion. According to those who have encountered one, they are striped, carnivorous, dog-sized felines. Records of the creature go as far back as pre-colonial times, and early maps of Australia even included images of the so-called native lions. One of the most recent reputable, in quotations, sightings happened in 2005, when four Air Force personnel spotted a creature in a quarry while out on patrol one night. They claimed to have found footprints in the mud, and even managed to capture an image of something peculiar on a night vision camera. Does the Queensland tiger truly exist? It may have been the last few members of the species. Or are the sightings of something else entirely? Until we can get accurate documentation, and hopefully footage, we may never know. But there is surely far more to discover from the land down under. Creepy Gargoyle Norman Tremblay received a trail camera for Christmas. He was hoping to use the camera to catch some local wildlife where he lives in the state of Maine. What he didn't expect was to catch what some have called a creepy gargoyle creature skulking through the forest. After setting up the trail camera, Norman was shocked to see what almost looked like the chupacabra, a mutant beaver, or some kind of twisted gargoyle plodding around in the woods. At first, he couldn't figure out what the animal really was. He thought it kind of looked like a porcupine, but there were no quills. He thought of a fisher cat, but it just didn't quite fit. Then there's the strange fact that the gargoyle monster was seen only 40 miles from author Stephen King's house near Bangor. This has led some people to speculate that the creature could have escaped from whatever twisted stuff is going on in the horror writer's house. Some research project gone wrong. The weird monster never was identified, although it may have been some creature that was sick. But just in case, if you are in the area, keep an eye out for a mystery beast that might be looking for blood. Mysterious Devil Creature A mysterious demonic creature has been found by archaeologists at a Russian lake. It happened in Siberia when Russian scientists discovered the remains of an unknown monster said to be living inside Lake Labankir. The lake is about 4,500 miles from Moscow, deep in the vast Siberian wilderness. Oddly enough, scientists were actually searching for some hint of the monster's existence when their underwater scanner revealed a huge skeleton resting at the bottom of the lake. According to what one of the researchers told the local news, they had a lot of different ideas about what the creature could be when they began their investigation. After all, it has been sighted so many times that there was no refuting a creature lived in the lake. However, they simply thought it was a giant fish, maybe a large reptile, or just some kind of weird amphibian. Instead of proving or disproving the theories, scientists only created more questions for themselves, as they had no way to properly identify the remains of the skeleton they found. They referred to it as the skeleton of some animal. This is one of those cases that proved completely inconclusive. Scientists are no closer to solving the mystery of the lake monster than they were when they started investigating. Giant Forest Ape While two men in Ohio took a leisurely walk through the woods, something creepy may have been following close behind them. The men had taken the walk many times before, and nothing ever happened to them. Nothing ever felt out of the ordinary. But this was one walk they would never forget. While trekking through Salt Fork State Park, the two men came face to face with a creepy forest monkey that they say resembled Bigfoot, or the legendary Sasquatch. According to the description given by the eyewitnesses, the creature had all the standard characteristics of Bigfoot. The thing was hairy, it walked on two legs, it shambled kind of like an ape, and it was frightening. However, not everyone is convinced. Some claim the two men are just trying to get attention, and they didn't actually see a giant forest ape. But these are just the naysayers. After all, why would two completely ordinary guys go out of their way to make up a Bigfoot sighting when they walk in the woods all the time? They didn't even want their full names revealed for privacy reasons, so it wasn't like they were looking for attention. Plus, Salt Fork State Park was placed on the list of the top 10 most likely places to witness the Sasquatch back in 2012, so there may actually be something lurking around. Many people have witnessed the Sasquatch in this park, with one witness, Nathan Gray from Winterset, saying the experience was scary. 
He witnessed the beast at a crossroads section, but as soon as he saw the monster, it vanished. Nathan said the scariest part was when it disappeared, because he didn't know where it was or if it was going to attack him from behind. Snaky Monsters on the Beach A pair of beach enthusiasts were strolling along the seashore on Hilton Head Island on a Tuesday when they saw something very creepy looking at them from underneath the sand. Joe and Shannon were shocked to see a pair of beady eyes and a pointy nose poking out at them. When Shannon bent down to get a closer look at the bizarre creature, it retreated back into its hole. They waited another couple seconds and the weird thing poked its head back out. It was one of the creepiest things either had ever witnessed at the beach. To make things even worse, the couple continued to see the mysterious creatures while they walked, almost stepping on their faces where they gawked at them from the sand. They had no idea what the weird things were, so they took some photographs and posted them online, at which point the South Carolina Department of Natural Resources got involved. According to them, Joe and Shannon had accidentally found a small group of shrimp eels. Although they are completely harmless to humans, they are beyond creepy. These ugly, snake-like monsters are a part of the eel family, rarely caught or seen by humans. They barely ever get captured in fishing nets, so biologists don't know much about their habitat or behavior. However, they do know that the creepy eels can grow to be three feet in length, and that they bury themselves in the sand and munch on whatever small critters get too close. Naked Alien In the dead of night, somebody witnessed what can only be described as a naked alien wandering along the side of the road. This sounds ridiculous, and yet there is footage of the spooky encounter. It happened in India, when a guy driving down a rural road on his bike spotted a skinny, very pale, and possibly emaciated humanoid without any clothes on. It obviously wasn't a local, seeing how pale and ghostly it looked. Nobody knows where the thing came from, and the people who witnessed it were too terrified to investigate. Nothing about the creature seemed human. When the motorcyclist stopped to take some pictures of the thing, it looked at him briefly, then walked off into the darkness. There have been a lot of weird ideas of what the creature could be. Some claim it was an alien that got lost, while others say it was just a sick, naked human going for a midnight stroll beneath the moonlight. However, one of the spookiest parts is that there was a red light that could be seen in the sky overhead at the same time, suggesting a UFO. And once the creature vanished into the dark, nobody ever saw it again. Borzilla There is a monster believed to be stalking the Fukushima dead zone in Japan, where the nuclear power plant suffered a massive failure back in 2011 and leaked nuclear sludge all over the place. The monster is known as Borzilla, but it doesn't have atomic breath and it's not 60 feet tall. Instead, Borzilla refers to the wild population of radioactive pigs that have become a problem around the Fukushima power plant. As some towns begin to reopen in the area, they are finding that the streets have been overrun with wild, aggressive, brave, and radioactive boars. There have been reports of horrifying boar attacks on humans. In fact, they are such a problem that hunters have been called in to deal with them. Maybe unfortunately for science fiction fans, the radioactive boars were not even a little bit mutated. They didn't turn into giant monsters and they had no cool superpowers or extra eyes. Instead, they were just angry and sick. The huge pigs contained so much radiation that eating one of them could make a person deathly ill. The Viking Capital A massively significant discovery has finally been made in the search for an ancient Viking capital in Shetland, UK. The excavations going on here are part of the Scaleway project, led by Christian Leith, who has been part of the crew hunting for the legendary capital of the Vikings in the United Kingdom ever since he accidentally stumbled upon a mysterious structure while digging out the foundation for his garden shed. The structure led to more roundhouse structures and 26 human remains. Christian actually crowdfunded the excavation himself, something that doesn't usually happen. He raised 20,000 pounds and brought in archaeological experts. It almost looked like it would be a bust. Nine trenches were dug throughout the year and nothing was found. On the very last day, just before archaeologists gave up hope, they made a huge discovery. They uncovered a structure that they believed to be part of a settlement, one used by the Vikings when they touched down on British soil back around 750 AD. The crew also found whetstones made of red sandstone that date back to the same period. The discovery shows the settlement is a minimum of 4,000 square meters, much larger than previously thought. While this may not seem that exciting on the outside, it's pretty amazing. The excavations are still going on as we speak, 
so they haven't uncovered the entire settlement yet. When all is said and done, the archaeologists are hoping to have uncovered a massive Viking city, previously unknown to history, where they'd likely launched many of their attacks on the surrounding kingdoms. Skeletons at the Beach A totally bizarre discovery was just made at the beach, and for once, it wasn't a sea monster. This time, buried beneath the sand at a beach in Wales, archaeologists uncovered hundreds of human skeletons that date back to the medieval era. It all began in 2014, during a string of particularly bad storms. Members of the public began complaining that there were bones sticking out of the sand. Human bones. So over the following years, archaeologists started digging them up. According to the BBC, the skeletons have all been dated back to between the 8th and 11th centuries, back when there had probably been an early Christian community living on the shore. The excavations themselves are quite complicated. Experts must carefully excavate each layer of sand to see what's hidden beneath. Surprisingly, the archaeologists said that they don't normally get this quality of preservation of bone from the early medieval period because the bone doesn't usually survive in the acidic Welsh soil. It just dissolves. So far, other than hordes of bodies, they've also found the walls of an old church. However, there has been an odd lack of artifacts. There have been 210 burials found, but almost no relics from the past. This has led researchers to speculate that there could have been a seaside church here, and the graveyard may have been a bit too close to the beach. Nobody actually knows what happened to the people who lived here. They seem to have vanished mysteriously and without a trace. Golden Death Masks At the National Archaeological Museum in Athens, there is a disturbing gold mask that scientists can't quite wrap their heads around. It's known as the Golden Death Mask of Agamemnon, and it was discovered at a royal cemetery in the ancient city of Mycenae, dating back as far as the 16th century BC. In total, there were five golden funeral masks uncovered, but they are still shrouded in mystery. The mask of Agamemnon was found by a German archaeologist in 1876. At the time, he was convinced that the tomb he'd uncovered was that of the legendary Mycenaean king from the Trojan War. Unfortunately, this proved not to be the case. The mask was ultimately dated to be 400 years older than the Trojan War. Nobody knows who the golden mask was crafted for. Based on its facial features, it was made to look like a man probably in his 30s. He had a long nose and a mustache and was buried with all the honors of a king, even with his corpse being covered in pure gold. In fact, he had sheets of 24 karat gold covering his whole body inside the tomb, with the mask being the most fascinating piece. Another really interesting thing is that the people who lived in this particular region of Greece had been poor farmers for hundreds of years, until within just one generation, archaeological evidence points to a sudden burst in wealth, riches, and exotic materials. Archaeologists still don't know why, and they still don't know who once wore the brilliant golden death mask. Methfish in the most incredible and disturbing recent discovery, researchers suggest that fish can get hooked on crystal meth. As totally outrageous as that is, it's apparently true. Fish are getting hooked on meth thanks to water polluted with human drugs. Research was done by scientists in the Czech Republic who deliberately got dozens of trout addicted to methamphetamine as part of a study on water pollution. The results of the study showed that illegal human drugs have devastating consequences on water ecosystems because fish get addicted to the water. And yes, there are drugs in polluted water. For the study, one group of trout was kept in a clean water tank for eight weeks. The other group was kept in a water tank laced with a small amount of meth. The amount was based on the same levels of meth found in polluted streams. After eight weeks, Researchers moved all the fish to one tank that had two streams of running water in it. One of the streams was laced. 50% of the fish that had been exposed to meth went straight to the tainted stream. Only 40% of the unexposed fish went to that same stream. Every fish from the meth tank became sluggish for 96 hours once moved to the clean tank, suggesting withdrawal. The result is that fish can get hooked on drugs too. And because there are alarming levels of drugs coming out of wastewater treatment plants, fish could be gathering there in unusually high numbers and becoming addicts, wreaking havoc on the environment. <laughs> warrior laid to rest The tomb of a legendary warrior was recently discovered in the city of Chiangyang, China. The tomb dates back 1800 years, 
to a volatile time in China's past. The tomb was discovered with domed roofs, the body of a man who died in his mid-40s, and his wife. Archaeologists don't know their names or why they were given such an impressive burial, but they were discovered with some pretty fascinating grave goods that suggest that this particular person could have been one of the famous warring lords of China in the time of the Three Kingdoms, perhaps Cao Cao or his son Cao Pi. Inside the tomb, archaeologists found some very impressive treasure, such as a large horse figurine, a pottery model of a huge mansion, strange figures of feathered humans, and plenty of gold jewelry and jade relics. All this stuff would have been gifted to a person of great import upon their death. But who was Cao Cao? Almost 2,000 years ago, during the end of the Han Dynasty, which had ruled China for 400 years, the city of Qiangyang was taken by the armies of Cao Cao. But shortly after, he was defeated. His burial was never found, which is why experts believe the warrior's tomb just uncovered could belong to him. New species found in unexpected place. Scientists have discovered a totally new species of beetle, and you'll never guess where they found it. The scientists made this amazing discovery thanks to fossilized dinosaur poop, particularly the fossilized feces from the Sylosaur, a type of herbivore that kind of looked like a raptor from the Jurassic Park movies. The creature lived between 237 and 227 million years ago. At some point, it dropped some waste, and that waste was attacked by hungry beetles, and through and through, the pile of waste fossilized into what is known today as a coprolite trapping the beetles inside of it. According to evolutionary biologist Martin Kvarnstrom from Sweden, coprolites are hidden treasure chests because until now, scientists have never bothered to look at them. They contain all kinds of microscopic fossils. By using a synchrotron scanner to create power x-rays, scientists uncovered entire beetle fossils inside the dino's droppings. They were able to recreate the beetle in its entirety and label it as a new species. The beetle itself isn't that interesting, it was just an ordinary dung beetle. But the fact that scientists identified a new species of anything inside a lump of dino coprolite millions of years old is pretty cool. A Lemur's Genome For the first time in history, a team of collaborating scientists led by Penn State University and working with the university in Madagascar have sequenced the full nuclear genome of the koala lemur. The koala lemur is one of the biggest lemur species to have ever lived on the planet. It went extinct on the island of Madagascar somewhere between 500 and 2,000 years ago, so not that long ago. Unraveling the mysterious animal's genome has revealed new information about the lemur's life as a primate and how it impacted its environment, including the impact of its extinction on the ecosystem of Madagascar. Today, there are over 100 species of lemurs living throughout Madagascar. But 2,000 years ago, there were significantly more. According to George Perry, associate professor of anthropology, scientists have found the skeletal remains of at least 17 species of extinct lemurs. All of these extinctions happened relatively recently, which is why it's so fascinating. Plus, all the extinct lemurs were significantly larger than the ones that survived. You're probably familiar with some of the smaller lemurs of today, the ones that are cute and tiny and can fit in the palm of your hand. But the extinct lemurs being studied by the team were giants, weighing upwards of 180 pounds. That's larger than your family dog. Even with the full genome sequence of the koala lemur, experts are having a difficult time tracing the origins of the animals. What I mean is that scientists can't figure out how so many lemur species prospered in the same place, especially since they can't figure out how they were all related. The team has no idea what killed off all the big lemurs with one of the main theories being that when humans settled on the island, they killed and ate them all. Synthetic Venom Scientists have finally figured out how to make their very own snake venom. Depending on your outlook, this is either an incredible discovery and good for science, or a potential disaster in the making. Ever since Victorian times, the only way for a person to survive a deadly snake attack was to get anti-venom injected into their veins. The only way to make anti-venom is to milk a snake by hand, not a job most people are super interested in doing. It also involves injecting the venom into another animal to provoke an immune response, before that animal's blood can be removed and purified for scientists to extract the antibodies. It's a long process. But now, scientists have finally figured out how to create a gland which produces venom inside a laboratory using stem cells, 
Let that sink in for a minute. Scientists have literally learned how to create a gland from a snake without a snake being involved. They simply grow the glands in a laboratory. Then the 3D replicas create venom identical to what a real snake would make. It's like growing a human lung and hooking it up to a respirator. In any case, the discovery is pretty amazing. Scientists hope to create more efficient anti-venom in the future without the need of real snakes. Iron Age Chariot A metal detectorist has once again struck gold. Mike Smith was out and about with his trusty metal detector on a piece of farmland in Pembrokeshire, England. He made an incredible discovery when he found parts of a chariot from the Iron Age. The handful of artifacts he uncovered could be worth up to seven figures, and they were declared national treasures. The artifact fragments were part of a ritual burial. About 2,000 years ago, somebody buried an entire chariot underground, probably as part of a very important person's funeral rites. The discovery was rare because nobody has ever found a chariot using a metal detector before. Mike nearly missed it too. Completely by chance, a sudden change in weather forced him to explore a different field, and that was when he found a Celtic harness decoration. He realized there would be more treasure in the area, and so after a significant amount of digging, he found the old chariot pieces, dated by the local museum archaeologists as being buried around the year 25 AD. So why was an entire chariot buried in the middle of a field? It's because the ancient Celtic people who once lived in the United Kingdom often buried their most prestigious warriors with the things most important to them in life, such as their weapons, their animals, and even their chariot. It's the equivalent of you being buried in a grave with your favorite dog and your favorite car. What else do you need in the afterlife? The Largest Comet The largest comet ever identified by modern scientists is now speeding towards the sun. Should you be worried? Well, scientists say not until around 2031. We can calm down before the storm hits again. The comet is huge, about 1,000 times larger than an ordinary comet, estimated to be up to 120 miles across. It will make its closest approach to our planet in 2031 on its way to our great life-giving star. According to researchers from the University of Pennsylvania, the comet was identified extremely early, which is giving scientists many years to observe its path through our solar system. Gary Bernstein, who helped to discover it, said they are excited for people to watch it evolve as it approaches and warms up. It is the most distant comet to be discovered on its incoming path, and it is a very infrequent visitor. The last time it came to our solar system was three million years ago. The icy comet's size was estimated based on how much sunlight it reflects, and it will be about as bright as Pluto's moon, so you'll need a telescope to see it. It probably won't smash directly into the sun and cause a giant explosion, so we probably don't need to worry about the total destruction of our own planet. More likely, the comet will zip around the sun and head off into the darkness of the galaxy. The Tomb of the Emperor The Great Terracotta Army is one of the most amazing archaeological discoveries ever made. But what a lot of people don't know is that it's only one of many amazing tombs, also packed full of incredible statues. The Terracotta Army was part of the tomb of the first emperor of China, Qin Shi Huang. But there was a tomb recently discovered that belonged to a Han Dynasty emperor named Jing, who lived around 188 to 141 BC. According to historical records, Emperor Jing was a stubborn man and an arrogant ruler who once beat his cousin to death during a board game. Jing was heavily influenced by the rise of Confucianism. He had a fairly stable style of governing that the people enjoyed, and he even reduced taxes, did not partake in too many military expeditions, and stopped punishing people by mutilating them. All in all, he went down in history as a pretty good emperor, so maybe his brother deserved it. Upon his death, Jing was put inside a tomb that rivaled even that of the first emperor whose tomb has never been opened. So far, about 8,000 figurines have been found as part of the Terracotta Army. However, Emperor Jing was buried with between 40,000 and 50,000 detailed statues that were meant to serve him in the afterlife. But he didn't only take warriors with him. Figurines have been found depicting courtiers, concubines, dancers, horses, pets, and even court eunuchs. It's not clear why the Chinese government hasn't been giving as much attention to this other tomb, even though it may be just or even more impressive as Emperor Qin. Wine Rituals 
An archaeological expedition has recently discovered leftover traces of wine in a zoomorphic vessel used in ritualistic ceremonies thousands of years ago. The wine vessels come from the archaeological site of Aradetis Orgora in the country of Georgia. The expedition was led by researchers from the Kafuskari University of Venice and the Georgian National Museum. The vessel dates back to the year 3000 BC. It's shaped like an animal, though it's not clear what kind. The vessel has three feet on its bottom and a hole in the back for pouring, but the head is missing. It was discovered on the charred remains of a floor where cultic activities once took place. What they found inside the vessel was preserved pollen from the common grapevine, suggesting that wine was used heavily in the rituals of the ancient Kura Araxes culture. The Kura Araxes people lived in modern-day Georgia, parts of Iran, and in the Palestinian region. They are the oldest prehistoric culture in the area, thriving up until the 3rd millennium BC. Where they went and why they vanished is still a bit of a mystery. Archaeologists believe the wine was either offered to the gods or consumed by whoever was participating in the ritual ceremony. It's also an interesting discovery because now we know grape wine has been cultivated in Georgia for at least 5,000 years, making it one of the oldest Georgian rituals. Even today, wine is drunk from vessels made of animal horns in rituals. Cannibal Aztecs Bones discovered at the Great Temple of the Aztecs in Mexico have revealed some pretty disturbing secrets. Archaeologist Gabino Lopez Arenas investigated skulls, jaws, and other bones that were found as remnants of offerings inside the temple, as well as around the old historic center. These pieces of bones were found with cuts and exposure to fire, which has led archaeologists to conclude that between the years 900 and 1521, the rulers of the Aztec civilization, as well as the priests, and some of the most prominent warriors, practiced cannibalism as part of their religion. According to Lopez, the evidence found throughout the ancient capital of Tenochtitlan shows that humans were decapitated and often dismembered, and then, almost immediately after that, they were thrown into a fire. Their bones show evidence of prolonged cooking, then immediate cutting. This suggests that the humans were roasted raw over the flames, then their flesh was scraped off and consumed. But why did the most important Aztec leaders eat human beings? Archaeologists say it has to do with absorbing the strength which still remained in the victims' bodies. The Aztecs looked at their human victims as the incarnations of whichever gods they represented, which meant when they ate their flesh, they would share in their divinity. However, it's important to note that they didn't eat human meat as part of their everyday diets. This was strictly a ritual thing for the elite members of society. The Lady of Cow the Lady of Cao is considered by archaeologists and historians to be the most important and powerful woman anywhere in ancient Peru. Peruvian archaeologist Regulo Franco, who was involved in the discovery of the Lady of Cao's tomb, says that she was the first woman in the Moche civilization to have absolute power over the nation. She was the absolute ruler. The Lady of Cao was buried in an impressive tomb, which remained hidden and untouched for 1,700 years until archaeologists recently came upon it. Her tomb was found at the Cao Viejo Temple, part of El Brujo archaeological complex on the northern coast of Peru. She was entombed with a fabulous collection of jewelry and grave goods, more even than most buried kings. She was also found entombed with five additional people, two priests, a pair of bodyguards, and a teenage girl. These people were meant to assist the Lady of Cao in the afterlife and were probably sacrificed for the opportunity. At the time of the discovery, the archaeologists had no idea they were dealing with a queen. She was encased in 25 layers of cloth, under a barrier of copper plates. Now researchers are saying that at 25 years old, the Lady of Cao was the most important ruler of the Moche people, even at her unimposing stature of 4 foot 10. She's also proof that women played a much more prominent role in South American cultures than previously believed. Beast Engravings Archaeologists are still baffled by the wild discoveries at Sutton Hoo, the biggest treasure hoard ever found on British soil. Specifically, the discovery of weird beasts etched into a mysterious artifact has caused some confusion. As you may already know, Sutton Hoo is a massive archaeological site that was first excavated back in 1939. It began with two medieval cemeteries and turned into a buried treasure unlike anything previously found. And even though the discovery was technically made around 80 years ago, there are new mysteries appearing all the time. For example, there was an artifact recently investigated that scientists couldn't identify. 
According to Dr. Brunning with the British Museum, there is a heavy gold buckle covered in bizarre features and depictions of monstrous beasts that nobody can figure out. The creatures are ambiguous, with limbs that are long and bodies contorted in unnatural positions. They look like goblins, or maybe aliens, and historians don't understand why they were engraved on the buckle or what they could mean for the rest of the horde. Could the warrior the buckle belonged to have been fighting strange medieval monsters back in 625 AD when the treasure was lost? Or it could be that whoever crafted the buckle had a horrifying imagination. Right now, archaeologists don't have the answers and they can't even figure out what kind of monsters are depicted here. Viking Age Mysteries A strange Viking mystery has been revealed in Norway. Using geo-radar, an archaeologist working with the NTNU University Museum discovered 15 burial mounds and 32 carved ditches. The issue here is that the discoveries were all made buried under solid ice. The archaeologist waited for the ground to be frozen and covered in snow, then took a four-wheeler and a ground-penetrating radar device to see what he could find. Ground-penetrating radar sends electromagnetic signals into the subsurface painting an image of what's hidden under the ice. It's kind of like an x-ray machine for the planet. Turns out there is a lot going on underground here. The radar proved that about nine feet under this solid ice is an entire world of Viking mysteries. Nobody knows who is buried in these 15 tombs or what treasures could be frozen solid down there. Archaeologists estimate the burials were from between 650 to 950 AD during what's known as the Viking Age. One of the biggest burial mounds was clocked in at having an inner dimension of around 100 feet, meaning it would have towered over the landscape before being destroyed and covered in ice. The radar also showed a ship burial under the ice, meaning there is a full Viking longboat down there with human bones and grave goods in it. But because the ice is so thick, it's basically impossible to bring these artifacts to the surface, but it has kept it safe from grave robbers. The Oldest Shoe a leather shoe was recently found in a German bog. That's not the most interesting headline, but it gets better when you learn that the shoe was lost in that bog for 2,000 years and uncovered recently by archaeologists, who say the shoe probably slipped off someone's foot, got trapped in the sticky mud, and then was perfectly preserved. The shoe was a type of sandal, simple, made from animal leather and closed with a leather strap. The shoe was found beside the remains of an ancient wooden road, a collection of wooden boards that had been laid across the marsh to allow people safe passage. Archaeologists even found a broken carriage axle. The obvious consensus here is that there was some kind of accident on the road, the wooden cart's axle broke, and someone lost their shoe trying to fix it. Thanks to the acidic conditions of the bog, the shoe remained just as it had been at the time of its departure from its owner's foot. It's now the oldest shoe ever discovered in the region and a great piece of evidence of how people dressed at the time. Dog Burials In Catalonia, Spain, archaeologists have come across evidence of ritual dog burials. These burials date back around 4,200 years before today, belonging to what is known as the pit grave culture. They were a group of Neolithic people in southern Europe, and the new discovery of the dog burials shows how they had a very close relationship with their animals. Dogs have been man's best friend for quite some time, and this is just more proof. Also interesting is that the dogs were often buried next to their owners, obviously thought of as part of the family. Genetic analysis even shows that they were fed similar diets to what humans were eating then, suggesting the people shared their meals with their dogs. So far, 26 dogs have been found in funerary structures from across four sites in Spain. Most of the pets only grew to be around six years old. However, a lot of the dogs died before they were one year old, suggesting they had been the victims of ritual sacrifice. But for what? Archaeologists don't know. They say the rituals only lasted for a span of about 100 years during the Iron Age. Afterwards, dogs continued to be buried with their owners, but they weren't killed on purpose. Stone Age Raves Looks like raging parties are nothing new. Apparently, they had raves back in the Stone Age. A new study has revealed proof that our ancient ancestors were dancing around like teenagers with glow sticks and EDM music. However, they were doing it a little differently. According to auditory archaeologist Rita Rainio, Stone Age people used ornaments made of elk teeth to create their music. These ornaments, almost like teeth wind chimes, were attached to their clothing. When they danced, the ornaments would make a great rattling noise. This apparently made it easier for them to immerse themselves in a musical soundscape 
riding their bodies to the rattling of the teeth. It was a Stone Age dance party. Rita actually tried it out for herself, dancing nonstop for six hours while wearing the elk tooth ornaments, reconstructed based on artifacts recovered from prehistoric graves in Russia. At a burial site, 177 graves of men, women, and children were found, with at least half containing elk tooth ornaments. The consensus is that the Stone Age people of Russia were fascinated with music and dance at least 5,000 years ago, but maybe even further back. Medieval Plague Victims Evidence has been found that in the initial days of the Great Plague, which wiped out roughly 60% of the European population in the 14th century, the victims of the pandemic were given very tidy burials. One of the problems with identifying plague victims today is that the disease ravaged the body so quickly that it never left any markers on the skeletons. But now, by studying DNA taken from the teeth of dead people, archaeologists working on the plague project were able to identify any person killed by the plague. Near Cambridge in the United Kingdom, archaeologists identified perfectly normal individuals buried at a parish cemetery. This is in stark contrast to the mass graves that came later on. What this suggests is that the more important a person was, the more likely they were to get a proper burial and not just be tossed into a pit. It also shows that there was more care taken near the beginning of the plague, whereas later, after half the population had been wiped out, all discretion was thrown to the wind and people were dumped or buried haphazardly. Tarim Red-Haired Mummies Northwestern China's Tarim Basin is known for both its rich history and amazing diversity. But perhaps one of the things that stands out the most are the red-haired Chinese mummies that have been found here, perfectly preserved. The mummies were first discovered in the 1930s by Swedish archaeologists, and then again in 2000, the Xinjiang Archaeological Institute discovered the oldest and best preserved to date. One of the most famous mummies is the beauty of Lao Lan. She was found in 1980, buried three feet beneath the ground. The salt in the soil helped keep her extremely well preserved, and she was wrapped in a woolen cloth with many funerary gifts. Bordering several countries and located along the historic Silk Road trade route, people have passed through the region for thousands of years. But the roots of the Tarim Basin's residents have long been a mystery. Where did they come from? Scientists are finally close to getting answers, thanks to a recent DNA analysis of the mummified remains that date back nearly 4,000 years. The 20 mummies that were tested were found at the edge of the basin at the Chiaohe tomb complex and were found among the earliest layer of burials. The DNA shows that the people descended from South Siberia and Western Eurasia. The DNA also showed that they had genetic mutations that are either rare or not known to happen among modern people. The researchers concluded that these red-haired Chinese mummies may have had close relations with Western Europe via their maternal ancestry. They also believe that the people buried at the site descended from Siberian and Mongolian populations that intermingled thousands of years earlier. Besides the mysterious mummies, archaeologists found many artifacts of human figurines, boat coffins, leather hides, and perhaps most memorable, phallus and vulva-shaped carvings. The site of the Tarim Basin spans a millennium making it an ideal place to search for answers to our human past and the mystery of the ancient people who lived here. Father Nazario's Stones Back in the late 19th century, a priest discovered a collection of fist-sized rocks bearing cryptic inscriptions in Puerto Rico. He was convinced that the artifacts were evidence of one of the lost tribes of Israel, but everyone else dismissed them as a hoax, just made to dupe tourists or artifact collectors. For almost 100 years, the rock sat ignored until 2001, when archaeologist Reniel Rodriguez Ramos stumbled upon them and decided to take a closer look. He recalled that the rocks were considered worthless, with one even being used as a doorstop. They got no love at all. Now known as Father Nazario Stones, the rocks have gotten much more attention. Researchers are reportedly becoming increasingly convinced that they are authentic and that they represent a lost language from pre-Columbian Puerto Rico. There are figures carved onto the surface of the stones. Rodriguez pointed out that one of the rocks seems to feature an image of a man wearing a turban. Altogether, there are over 300 stones, and they contain at least 20 repetitive symbols that he has identified. Yet the island's original inhabitants, the Tainos, left behind no known evidence of a written language. The research team has narrowed it down to some sort of system of annotation and not decoration, but they have no idea what it means. Nothing like this has ever been found in the Americas, 
and depending on what the symbols mean or where they came from, it could rewrite the region's history. Chinese Artifact in North America In July 2014, an amateur artifact hunter discovered a partially exposed sword on the banks of a stream in the U.S. state of Georgia. But it wasn't just any sword, it was a Chinese sword. It has a strange shape and is carved with many symbols and designs that we still don't really understand. It's among the latest alleged out-of-place Chinese artifacts that have turned up in recent years in North America. The 12-inch long weapon was provisionally identified as being made from a rare mineral called lizardite, which is found in both the northern and southern hemispheres. But more tests are admittedly necessary to determine the material's type and origin. The sword is reportedly the only artifact of its type ever found in North America. Some people are starting to believe that perhaps the ancient Chinese also made it to the Americas long before Columbus. There is a dragon figure on the top of the blade which was typical of the Shang dynasty and a feathered crown. It bears some similarities to the Mesoamerican jaguar god, indicating maybe there was a connection between the Chinese and the Olmecs. There are some similarities between Chinese and Olmec symbolism and mythology, and this contentious debate has perplexed researchers for over a century. Did they ever actually meet, or are these types of similarities just a coincidence? A common human experience? What do you think? Let me know in the comments below. Just want to give a big shout out to Miss Sin 85 I hope you're having a wonderful night, and to Jason Zorn. Cheers to both of you, and thank you so much for hanging out with us. If you are new here, be sure to subscribe for more videos on archaeology and amazing discoveries. Stolen Viking Treasure In 2015, metal detectorist George Powell and Leighton Davies dug up a hoard of Viking treasure in Herefordshire in England. But all did not go as planned, because the land was owned by Lord Cawley, who did not give the pair permission to dig. Whoops! The artifacts included gold jewelry, silver ingots, and around 300 Anglo-Saxon coins, which experts believe were buried by a Viking warrior over 1,000 years ago. Included among the jewelry was a ring, an arm bracelet, and a small crystal ball pendant dating back between the 5th and 9th centuries. Powell and Davies decided to keep it quiet and did not report the multi-million dollar find as the law requires, and instead began trying to sell it to antique dealers. Much to the frustration of historians, authorities were unable to recover most of the coins and the dynamic duo got into big, big trouble. The artifacts that have been recovered offer unprecedented insight into life during the time of King Alfred the Great, which was defined by a 9th century power struggle that experts know little about. For example, rumor has it that two of the lost coins depict the leaders King Alfred the Great of Wessex and Seolwulf II of Mercia pointing toward a previously unknown alliance between the two. Were they friends? Probably not, but at some point they were getting along. Authorities continue to hold out hope that some of the missing artifacts will be returned, but that might never happen, and they have no choice but to accept this possible reality. Meanwhile, Powell is serving 10 years in prison for his crime, while Davies is spending eight and a half years behind bars. Worth it? I don't think so. Cat Domestication The domestication of the modern house cat is a little understood phenomenon. When did cats start becoming pets? I mean, some would argue that even today, cats are elusive and mysterious creatures. A 2013 study traced the first known instance of a mutual relationship between humans and cats to an ancient agricultural Chinese settlement called Quan Hukun. This farming village 5,300 years ago attracted all kinds of rodents, which in turn attracted cats, who could eat to their heart's content. They started hanging around people, and the rest is history. Hanging around humans was highly beneficial for them, and you know how cats are. But farmers also benefited from the cats, who served as a de facto form of pest control. Evidence suggests that people and cats became closer over time. For example, the remains of an elderly cat found in the ancient village show that the animal was well cared for. Another feline bore evidence of eating millet, indicating that someone fed the cat. It's also possible that the cat scavenged. But the findings show that humans and felines spent considerable time in close proximity to one another either way. These interactions do not mean that cats were domesticated. Instead, they show that felines began to live peacefully among humans and at some point began benefiting from us, leading to their eventual domestication. Scientists are still admittedly trying to trace the origin of modern domestic cats, 
which they believe descended from African wildcats as far back as 8000 BC during the Neolithic period. Much of this is speculative, since the earliest known evidence of cat domestication dates back to around 4000 years ago in ancient Egypt. For now, researchers are still working to find the missing pieces of this puzzle. New Hominid Species The history of the human species and our closest relatives is confusing at best and researchers are continuously working to try to piece everything together, and new discoveries sometimes raise more questions than answers. In 2013, volunteers found a collection of hominid remains deep within a cave in Johannesburg, South Africa. They recovered over 1,400 fossilized bone fragments and 140 teeth, constituting the single richest fossil deposit of its kind throughout Africa. And, much to the team's surprise, the remains included evidence of a previously unidentified extinct species from the Homo genus. Dubbed Homo naledi, the prehistoric primate had a small brain and an ape-like torso and shoulders. Dating back between 335,000 and 236,000 years, the bones also contain evidence of numerous human-like features and the species may have lived alongside the earliest modern humans. It's clear that H. naledi and Homo sapiens, aka us humans, are related, but the question of how they're related remains unanswered, and experts are unsure where the newly discovered species is situated on the hominid family tree. The discovery's most baffling aspect stems from the realization that the H. naledi bones appear to have been deliberately left in the cave. This behavior has not been observed in other equally primitive hominids. It seems that they may have had some sort of primitive ritual or burial practice, or maybe they lived in caves before others did. It was so long ago, it's a miracle there are even any bone fragments left. Who built the Great Pyramids of Giza? Legend holds that the Great Pyramids of Giza were built by slaves, but a cluster of 4,000-year-old burials located nearby suggests that the iconic structures were actually built by paid laborers. Located nine feet underground, the mud brick tombs contain the well-preserved remains of roughly a dozen individuals, who experts believe helped build the ancient monuments. The deceased were laid to rest with jars of beer and bread for use in the afterlife. The graves were discovered near other pyramid builders' burials, which were first found in 1990, thanks to a vigilant tourist. These discoveries offer valuable insight into the lifestyle and origins of the people who built the Great Pyramids. They also show that pyramid builders were paid for their labor, and that they were not forced to work, according to Egypt's chief archaeologist, Zahi Hawass. The misconception that pyramid builders were slaves may have started with the Book of Exodus, which claims that Egyptians enslaved the Israelites. A former Israeli prime minister in 1977 claimed that Jews built the pyramids, adding to the myth. The story perpetuated from there, thanks largely to Hollywood. The builders were admittedly poor, and their skeletons bear obvious signs of arthritis and other health problems, but they were also respected for their labor. They worked in three-month rotations and regularly ate meat, with the estimated workforce of 10,000 people consuming around 21 cattle and 23 sheep daily. They ate meat much more often than the average population. Workers who died during construction were buried near the pyramids, which were considered sacred property of the pharaohs. Although no gold or other valuables were found within the tombs, their proximity to the pyramids speaks to their importance. Hawass said that the individuals would have never been buried the way that they were if they had been slaves. The Library of Alexandria Speaking of ancient Egypt, the burning of the Great Library at Alexandria is largely considered one of history's worst travesties. Founded in 283 BC, it was once the ancient world's largest library, housing over 100 scholars, as well as texts written by historically famous thinkers like Homer, Plato, and Socrates. Despite its renowned reputation, the library did not admit visitors based on wealth. Instead, it was open to anyone who proved to be a worthy scholar. Legend holds that the Great Library was tragically burned to the ground in a single event, but evidence suggests that the library's decline and the destruction of hundreds of thousands of its manuscripts was much more gradual, and that same as today, money issues played a major role. The first fire at the Great Library allegedly happened around 40 AD, when Julius Caesar and his invading forces set it on fire. This marked the first in a series of destructive battles and blazes that happened over the following centuries. 
Government spending cuts and other policy changes played a major role in tipping the library into non-existence. Roman Emperor Marcus Aurelius effectively shut the establishment down when he revoked resident scholars' pay and banned foreign scholars from visiting. From there, the library's precious contents were neglected and forgotten. In 391 AD and 415 AD, religious riots further damaged the facility. The library met its end in the year 640 when it was captured by Arab forces, who reportedly gathered the remaining manuscripts and used them as fuel for bathhouses, completing the destruction. African Artifacts in South America some scholars believe that there is evidence of African people making contact with people in South America, once again long before Christopher Columbus sailed to the New World in 1492. One theory describes how King Abu Kari II headed a voyage from modern-day Mali to South America around 1300, but some believe that Africans reached the continent much earlier. Writing for Face to Face Africa in 2018, Nduta Waweru claimed that archaeologists have discovered artifacts in South America suggesting that Africans lived there as far back as sometime between 13,000 BC and 600 AD. Evidence suggests that people from Axum, Meroe, and the land of Punt settled in South America during that time period, according to Waweru, who said that African skulls have been found in Ecuador, Chile, and Peru. There are alleged similarities between African and South American religions that may point toward the possibility of pre-Columbian contact, including images of South American deities that resemble African people. There are also correlations between early medical practices found on both continents, such as trepanning, which involved drilling holes in the skull. Archaeologists have reportedly found pots and water jars from the land of Punt, and Columbus himself supposedly described the people he encountered as black-skinned and having arrived from the south and southeast in trading ships that dealt in gold-tipped spears. These claims are widely rejected by mainstream experts, and they're admittedly far from proven. But as the narrative of who arrived in the Americas first, after Native Americans, constantly changes and is held up to increasingly credible scrutiny, more people are opening their minds to this possibility. There are also theories that people from other places, such as China, like I mentioned before, as well as Sumerians or other European people, beat Columbus to the Americas. And researchers have already more or less proven that the Vikings set foot in North America long before Columbus arrived. Thanks for watching! If you'd like to learn about more discoveries that could rewrite history, let me know in the comments below. And be sure to hit that subscribe button before you go. See you next time! Bye!